What a blast, right? Uh, please uh, let me welcome the star of the film, Tilda Swinton, and the director, Luca Guadagnino. Uh, thank you so much for the movie. I saw it for the second time last night. In terms of this project, it's based on a 1960s French film, La Piscine. What about that project drew both of you to it? Well, I, I, uh, the, the, the movie by Jacques Deray uh, wasn't uh, on the top of my mind. Uh, in general, it's a movie that I have seen when I was younger, but I haven't be be got, got back there. Uh, but there was in the in the in the story in the, of the film some sort of universality that could have been interesting to 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 to, to address to look for like desire what people makes uh, of their own desires for the others in particular and the, I, th I think that the, the, the film by Jacques Derrida was just an, an occasion. And I, um, Luca and I are pretty much always working together uh, on one thing or another. But this film wasn't one of them. Um, and Luca was developing it and going to make it, uh, and I wasn't. And then quite late in the day, he came to me and said, actually, what do you reckon? Pantelleria, two months in the summer, th these people. Uh, and, uh, and so we kind of negotiated a way in which I, I felt I could be involved. Uh, and uh, that point, um, Marianne was going to be an actress, and uh, it was very talky. And um, I proposed to, to um, Luca and Dave that she not only not speak, but that she be a rock star. What central parts about the relationship that were in the original story? What did you want to focus in on, and maybe what did you want to change? So you have, um, you have Marianne, who's this legend, um, who's had uh, an operation on her vocal cords and so can't talk. And she and Paul, her, hus her sweetheart, who is a recovering alcoholic who recently attempted suicide, have gone to Pantelleria to kind of lick their wounds and hide out and be quiet and uh, into this idyll. And it really is an idyll. Uh, crash lands uh, Harry Hawks, who's played by Ray Fiennes, who's a complete nightmare. The most wonderful kind. Absolute of. nightmare. And uh, he, he's her old lover and also record producer. So he's, he's come to kind of get her back in every sense. And he brings with him all that drama that she's trying to avoid. And, and he needles Paul and he needles Marianne. And he brings with him this daughter, Dakota Johnson, who he didn't even know he had, who's just tipped up in his life. So it's, uh, it's a bundle of laughs, you can imagine. We actually have a trip of the, I mean a clip rather, a of trip. the reunion. Trip. And it is a trip. Um, and did you spend, how much prep time did you have in Pantelleria uh, before you started shooting? Not enough. <laughs> um, no, nah, it was one of those films that, I have to confess, doesn't frighten us because we've developed balls of steel around this kind of filmmaking so you know we are not scared by um, last minute things but no it came together at the very very last minute I think Dakota Johnson came on I mean it was the week before we started exactly. shooting basically uh, yeah so it was a real kind of uh, confluence okay great we um, were, were there a trip uh, we'll be playing a clip Jesus um, about um, when you and Ray Fiennes have your first sort of, I don't want to call it a heart to heart, but maybe the confrontation during uh, the parade, um, where it becomes clear that he's not just casually there to catch up with old friends. Uh, just, uh, just some easy breezy vacation talk that everyone wants to have while they're kicking back. Did you spend a lot of time thinking about things that aren't on screen, parts of her story that we don't necessarily get a chance to have access to? Yeah, that's very well put, Bill, because in a way, uh, the film is all about what's not on screen. It's a holiday, you know? It's people taking a dog leg out of their normal lives and in a state of denial about the fact that they have normal lives and they have these huge decisions to go back to. Um, does one switch it up? You know, she's made this step, broken up with Harry, got clean, because uh, they're like super intoxicated, Harry and her, and so you see that in flashbacks that they, they're in a very medicated relationship. And she's got clean, she's now with Paul, she's trying to live a much more sort of, you know, just healthy life. 
and, and give herself permission to do that. And then he comes in and says, really? Don't you want a little of that endless rock and roll, which means we never age and we never die? So it's really, that's the sort of, that's the hinge that she's constantly kind of throughout the film. Um, so in a way, thinking about what her life at home in New York or wherever they live um, might be um, was, was all we were ever doing because they're in this sort of, we're all having a jolly holiday mode. Uh, for the next clip that we have, uh, it sort of showcases your, t uh, your character and Rafe's character falling into familiar rhythms a bit. Uh, it's a, you probably never knew you dreamed of karaokeing with uh, Rafe Fiennes and Tilda Swinton, but uh, it is realized for you in the film. So here it is. How did you choose the existing music? The Rolling Stones plays a significant part in the movie. Um, why did you choose to go for that? Um, so, you, uh, so there is the music that he plays, uh, which inc includes the Stones, Harry Nilsson, a lot of energetic sound that almost, I mean, they clearly disrupt the quietness of Marianne and Paul. Then there is uh, a, a soundtrack that plays over, over the images often that is in the same, um, comes from the same era of the Rolling Stones uh, moment of glory, which I mean, I think they're still glorious, but uh, let's say in the six, end of the 60s, early 70s, which is uh, um, uh, some compositions from Anton Carlos Jobim, uh, which is a sort of parallel music counteract of, uh, of the Stones. Um, and also there is opera and, and, uh, and John Adams. Um, and I'd love to throw it to the audience for some questions right now. Um, the mics will be coming up, I believe. My question is for Tilda. Um, I was just wondering, you're such a, an interesting and compelling artist to watch. What do you consider as the place of art in society? I think that, uh, that art is actually what people make, whether they call themselves artists or not. Um, and uh, art is culture, and it's not a luxury. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredibly... It's about health, it's about mental health. I mean, we honestly can't and couldn't live without art. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not an option. There wasn't much dialogue. Um, how were you able to sort of uh, convey an energy behind your emotions and was it mainly like character expression, facial expressions? The, the whole experiment of Marianne not having a, boy, a voice was uh, was something we were really both very, very intrigued by um, because it's the story of old relationships. These people have known each other for a very, very long time. A lot of water's gone under the bridge. And it just, I'm so interested in the way we communicate with one another and this fantasy about the fact that it might be easy. I don't believe it's easy at all. That's what I think is glorious about communication is it's really hard and we have to keep trying to you know, master languages, we keep having to find ways of writing and making art and making relationships where we can actually express ourselves properly and we keep having to face that we fail all the time and that we misunderstand each other and we can't hear each other properly. I mean, I just think that's the stuff of, the stuff of, of art um, because it's the stuff of life. So that's what we were looking at with, with one of this group not being able to speak uh, particularly in relation to the relationship between Harry and Marianne, because they, you, you get the sense that they know each other so well that, you know, he knows what she's thinking. He can read her thoughts and she can kind of send him Morse code messages with her eyes. They've, they've been here so many times before. Um, it just felt like an, a, a kind of exchange of electricity. So, for example, that scene, to me, every time I see it, it's a dialogue. They are, they are both contributing. Um, but, but really, in answer to your question, and, and to speak technically as an actor is not what I generally do, but it's just about listening. Just really trying to listen and, um, and to go from zero all the time so that he says something and the question is, so how does that make me feel? What does that do to my face? What does that do to my body? What does that do to my rhythm? And, and just that, just keep 
keep listening. I mean, for me, it was grace to not speak. I'm, as I've established, extremely idle, and learning lines is a real drag. And uh, and and but but more than that, not to be flippant, this it, it give gave me the luxury of just hanging out and listening and attending to what everybody else was doing. Um, I mean, for Tilda to do that, not just Marianne. So um, I think that was a real grace. It was a, it was a, it, it, it took me to, to interesting places that I hadn't, I wouldn't have been able to go if I just had masses of dialogue to, to, to bat back at him. Like either uh, in the year 2016 or in your lives personally, does it feel uh, like this project came along at this moment for a specific reason? Well, I, I, my mother is Algerian, and so in the Arab culture, f the faith is very important. So I take it uh, as a great uh, uh, wisdom to, to g get things how they come. I think it's really interesting, thinking back to your question, there's a real balance, which does, you do get better at a balance with a long working relationship. The balance between being creative and being receptive. So, yes, sometimes you're you know, really putting a mud pie together with your own hands that otherwise would not exist, and you're having to do all the legwork yourself. And then other times you're, you know, Studio Canal, contact Luca and invite him to do uh, a, a remake or a reimagining of uh, the Jacques Deray film. And honestly speaking, if he had said no, they probably would have asked somebody else. So that's a different beginning to the project, but you have to be, your knees have to be bent. You know, you have to go, is there something in there for me? You know, it's like, it's like life, you know, you either throw a party yourself or you might decide to go to somebody else's and then you kind of take it over and make it your own. It's, uh, it's, just, it's just like, it's just keeping limber. I mean, for us it is. I, I think some people only work one way. Maybe some people only do the mud pie way and some people only do the going to other people's parties. But we're, we're pretty flexible, I think, over the years. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for your film, and thank you for being here. A Bigger Splash uh, comes out next Friday. Thank, thank you. you.